So what we would like to do with the wrap up is to connect the talk shows or three of the talk shows um, with your curriculum. So with the why, with the what and with the how. And I would like to do this interactively. So we don't have that many students. So please come forward. Please help me. Come on. I have a lot of notes and I can't read half of them. So I need your help. <laughs> so I would like to start. Come on, guys, move forward. I'm not going to start until I have more people in the front. So. Also, for the people from home who are watching as a streaming, we have the Twitter open and we have the stream open, so you can also comment there or you can ask questions if you have any. Um, what I would like to start with for this wrap-up, you have probably seen this. Uh, I don't know if any of you have opened and watched the video, but I thought maybe we show it now so we get an idea of what if it must feel like for you guys to be engineers. I'm not an engineer, so I don't know. So I kind of get the feeling I would like to become one when I see this video. If it starts. Why is it not starting? Oh, come on. Uh, it's not helping, that is not starting up. But in the meanwhile, we got people in the front. Um, how many of you have you actually seen this video before? One? <laughs> okay, so I really want to show it to you now. Um, I have no idea. Yes, do we have sound? No, we don't. Georgia Tech yes. because we want to do the impossible and this school is equipped with the resources and faculty to help us do oh come on I really want to show you this video so I really hope this works we have some Wi-Fi problems here um, Yes, so as you can notice right now, you often have problems with technology and you have this within organizations too. And what happens when you have problems with organization, people go to managers. And usually because engineers are there to solve problems, what people do is they go to their engineer managers. So they will come to you in the future and ask about various problem, including the internet is not working and it will probably be not related to your work. Um, Oh, I'm really sorry, this is not working. Can we do anything? No. Um, I can't even tell you what the video is about because if I tell you, it's not just as interesting. So, yeah, let's see, thank you. See, engineers, business person, no clue. But I think then if I refresh, then it will refresh the presentation. Um, so we move to the next point that I wanted to make while hopefully my computer refreshes without crashing. Um, if you think of new product breakthrough, of new technologies that have changed our life, what comes to your mind? We don't need to use the mic, but please speak loud so I can repeat. Can you think of any product that changed the way, or any technology that changed the way you live your life? Yes? Microchips? Microchips? Yes? Something else? Engineers. You're engineers, guys. You cannot think of any breakthrough technology in the last 20 years? Smartphones. Smartphones? Yes? The GPS? Yes? Something else? Well, the point. Um, is can you also think of any management changes uh, that have really influenced the way organizations are managed today? Any management styles, any models, any ways uh, a manager or a CEO can deal with their organizational problems? 
Well, now I'm not surprised that you don't have an answer because that's a very common problem. We have a lot of new technologies that are coming up every day and every day. And what happens is we don't have new management styles, new management processes to deal with this technology. So what we do is we try to apply some of the models we have in the Timo course in order to deal with this problem, to deal with change. And we saw this morning a model about the management of change where you have to address the change, see how it relates to the, um, sit the current situation and how it will affect the organization in the future. And that's exactly how change management works and it's extremely important. And now nothing is working on my computer and I have no Wi-Fi at all. <laughs> so um, I can't get access to the presentation. Okay, we do it without the, the visual aid. Oh, now we have it. I'm sorry. We checked this morning, it worked. Now it's gone again. Um, so when we talk about the organizations, your book tells you that the organization is a collection of people who work together and coordinate their actions to achieve a variety of goals and, uh, or a desired set of future outcomes. So when we talk about management, we talked about the planning, the organizing, the leading and the controlling of this group of people and of all the other resources that you have within the organization to make it work efficiently, efficiently and effectively. And when we talk about organizational performance, we talked about how can managers actually get the organization to work efficiently and effectively by using the valuable resources they have within their organization. One of these valuable resources is actually you as engineers uh, in your future career. So hopefully we try this one more time. If this doesn't work, I go on without. And then promise me you watch it at home because it's really worth because watching. Because we want to do the impossible. And this school is equipped with the resources and faculty to help us do just that. And so, in the words of Sir Isaac Newton, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Georgia Tech is proud of its many traditions, but the one I find most exciting is our tradition of excellence. Our mission as students is not to follow in the footsteps of the astronauts, Nobel Prize laureates, and president who graduated before us, but to exceed their footsteps, crush the shoulders of the giants upon whom we stand. We here are all such innovative people, so I am telling you, if you want to change the world, you're at Georgia Tech. You can do that. If you want to build the Iron Man suit, you're at Georgia Tech. You can do that. If you want to play the music during your convocation speech like a badass, we're at Georgia Tech. We can do that. I am doing that. Congratulations on your acceptance. <laughs> and brace yourselves for a hell of a ride on your way to becoming a hell of an engineer. Yes, so now we saw the video. I hope you can see why I wanted to show it to you. But then my question is, we already went on to the products and the management break, the, the breakthrough in the practice of management. Do you think working only with technology and be a successful chemical, mechanical engineer is enough to be successful? Yes? Can we have the cube? I think now we need the cube. It really depends on how you define success. If you just want to be at your workplace, do your job and get your salary and go home and have a lovely family life, yeah, it's fine. But if you want to move on and do something for yourself or your company, or get promoted, you have to know more than just uh, the technical stuff. And you're right, but I also want to challenge you on that because 
When you work as engineers, uh, it's true that you start in the R&D departments and you work with the technical stuff a lot at the beginning. Unless you go into consulting and you join BCG or Implement, for example, as we saw in the talk show. But as we saw with AAK, at some point, you will need to step up. So what happens when you're working in the R&D department, and you start uh, in the lab, and you start working with your technical stuff, this, mm, stuff, and you develop your skills at your maximum level. It reaches the point where you're so good at what you're doing that someone in the organization, probably your manager, your boss, will come to you and say, hey, we think you're doing a great job. Would you like to lead a team? And suddenly, you're not just an engineer working with technical skills anymore, you're actually a project manager or a team manager. And you have people. And that's why we do Timo. You saw during the Novo Nordisk uh, talk show last week that you have an organizational chart uh, that is much more complicated than the structure that you can put on paper. Because when we have an organization, we have a lot of people. And people are not just a set of hands, as he said, are human beings. So they're complicated. They have problems, they have issues. Um, maybe they don't want to work with the team members. I'm sure that you have had a lot of issues in your work group works, not only in Timo, but everywhere. And as a team manager uh, in your R&D department, you're going to have to deal with that. And it, you will reach a point um, that you will probably going to be asked, you were a great team manager, you're doing great with your technical skills, we would like to make you head of the R&D department. And then you have an even bigger organization to deal with. You have an even bigger set of people with their problems and their issues and their skills and their resources that you need to manage and make the best of. So that's why we have Timo. And another thing that is important to consider when we talk about organization is bounded rationality. We are human, we don't know everything. Well, you're engineers, you know a lot, but you still have a limited amount of information that you can have, that you can process. And you have time constraint, you have a limited amount of time. So you need to use your resources in the best possible way. And the models and the tools that we try to offer you with Timo try to do is just that, teach you how to deal with that um, in an organization. And one more thing of the why it is important to um, to deal with, uh, with different issues in, in management and in organization is because you have teams and teams have different, um, different processes and follow different steps. And as a manager, you need to know, okay, at which step is this particular team? Can I do something to support it? Can we do something to learn from it? Yes. So the why question is, when you are, as a manager or as an engineer, want to step up and try to move along uh, the organization and try to deal with this uh, big group of people that you have around you, the purpose that you have is to create value for your organization and for the people that you have around you. And you do it by planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. So when we saw this in the, in the talk, what we saw in the talk shows is that, for example, Implement told us that for organizations it's not enough to just exploit. So to just have, if they want to be successful in the long run, if they want to grow, uh, if they want to create value, it is not enough to just exploit, to just continue on the line of business that they have. Very often they need to explore, they need to be innovative, and they need to change things within the organization. Um, and to do this, Implement specifically uses a model, which is the MTOR, that's what they call it. So market, technology, organization, and resources. And this is pretty much a condensed way of what we do with Timo as well, because they are looking into the market, into the outside, they are looking into the technology, so into the technical skills, uh, technical resources that an organization has within their boundaries, and also the technical skill and resources that the organization can gain from the outside, from their partners, um, even from their competitors sometimes. Um, and then they look into the organization and into the specific resources they have. So. If we talk about incomplete information and bounded rationality, I don't know if you remember the case of AAK with the she oil production. Uh, one of the things that, um, that they said was that dealing with the she oil uh, production line was very difficult because they have limited information on how the system works. They have this big group of women, they have middlemen, uh, and they have a long 
range of people to manage in between. So they're trying to work directly with the women so that they can have a more uh, wide set of information um, on their production line. If you look at the, at the why, so if you look at the value creation and the job of a manager, can you think of anything from the talk show that you can connect to this? A case or an example? Nothing? Okay. Did you remember the web ban case that was presented by Implement last week as a failure case? Nothing as well? So the web ban, ca web ban case um, was basically the case of a company who decided to, uh, to do delivery or online uh, shopping and uh, home delivery of grocery stuff. And they built up the whole organization. They bought the vans, they organized logistics, they bought the, or they rented the spaces where they could keep the, the goods and they were ready to go but then they realized they didn't, have, um, they didn't have any customers. Nobody wanted to buy their product. Nobody wanted to use um, their website. And in, if you try to connect this to this model, then one of the things they had was incomplete information, and they didn't do anything to solve the incomplete information. They didn't know what their target was. They didn't know what the market was, and they didn't do anything to find out. If they had, they would have probably seen how do we make this work. And to, just to give you a, a more success case that is similar to that, we move to the business model canvas. And some of you asked, where is the Tesco video? Now this is the Tesco video. I hope this time it works, yes? Unique market. Tesco has been evolving itself, adjusting to the local market. It even changed the name itself from Tesco to Home Plus, and at last, it grew to rank number two in Korea. But Tesco had to overcome one obstacle, a fewer number of stores compared to the number one company, Emart. Mission, could we become number one without increasing the number of stores? We made an in-depth study into Koreans once more. Koreans are the second most hardworking people in the world. For them, grocery shopping once a week is a dreaded task. So we decided to approach these busy and tired people. Idea. Let the store come to the people. We created virtual stores, hoping to blend into people's everyday lives. Our first try was subway stations. Although virtual, the displays were exactly the same as actual stores, from the display to the merchandise. Okay, this one I can tell you, and then you can watch it at home. Um, what Tesco did was they built uh, these virtual supermarkets in the metro stations so that people, when they were waiting for the train, could just grocery shop, and the app would save what they were shopping. So if the train arrived, they could just step on the train, and when they stepped out, there was another board where they could select the next products and then at the at the end of their shopping they could just eat send um, they can actually still working uh, they can eat send and then the grocery is delivered to their home place so you have been working with the business model canvas now for some time what what did Tesco did can I please get something from you guys can you relate yes yeah so why don't you just turn left and talk to the person on your left on what did Tesco do, and then we talk about it together?
Okay. We have people at home too. I don't know if they're talking to their computer or, well, luckily enough, you're engineers, so you figure out if everybody looks to the left, then nobody's talking to anybody. But <laughs> you were talking, so you figured out. So what did Tesco do? Can we have someone? Where is the mic? Is over there? Okay, you have the mic, but you talked already, so you pass yeah. it on to someone next to you. Somebody wants it? Well, they changed the distribution channels, so the relationship with the customer was indirect instead of through the stores. Yes, someone else? Uh, they added Metroline advertisement as, as one of their key resources. Mm -hmm. Something else? Yes? <coughs> they found a value in uh, Communicating in a new, a new, having a new relationship to their customers, knowing that they're busy working a lot, they needed to communicate with them outside of the store. So they did that by yeah. advertisement. So just because you weren't talking too much into the mic, so what he said was that they um, they looked into the customer and they found the value that the customers were looking for, right? <coughs> yes, we have one more. They added a service. Uh, with, which supports their products. Mm -hmm. So um, it boosts their value. It's the same thing as you said, but yeah. I'm just highlighting the service point of view yes. of, the, of the store. Yes, so to build on what you just said, what they did was they went to the value proposition, they looked who are our customers and who are, what are the pains and the gains and the customer jobs of our customer target. And then what they did, they went back to the value proposition and said, okay, how do we transform the pain, the gains, and the customer jobs of our segment into something that solves their problem, gives them value, helps them to, to have a better day? Uh, and then they build up the customer relationships. They build up the channels by putting the metro up. Um, and then they went back into the offstage part of the business model canvas. And so they looked into the key partners. So they had a, to have a partnership with a metro station, with a, with a metro. Um, they had to uh, work into the key resources because they needed some technology to support what they were doing and so on. So what they did was they took their business model canvas. They saw it wasn't working because the customers in Korea didn't have time to go to Tesco like they do in the UK. Uh, because they're spending a lot of time traveling. Uh, and they started in the on-stage part of the business model canvas, and then they moved back into the off-stage part of the business model canvas. So if you now think of the talk shows, we had similar examples. Uh, AAK told us that they don't provide products, they provide solutions to their customers. And they do that by uh, combining the technology and the services associated to the technology in their value proposition. So by doing so, what happens is they put a price on the technology and the customers get all the service for free. So if they have a problem with the technology, if they can um, get the, the oil to work the way they want to, uh, AAK helps them to solve that problem and it does it for free. And that's part of the value proposition and that works for them. And some, someone asked while we were having the talk show, so why don't you do consulting? Why don't you sell uh, that, uh, that service? And what he said was, well, given our key resources, given how the offstage part of our business model works, at the moment we are not able to provide consulting as part of our value proposition or we're not able to use it as a separate business model. One thing that I would like to add to this, if, if you think of the business model canvas book. You have a part that talks about the different types of business model. And one of it is the spin-off. So what the business model canvas book tells you about is that if you have something that you have in-house, but you can't really exploit it because you don't have the resources. So because the, um, because the off-stage part of your business model canvas doesn't support uh, the value that you can see you can offer for a specific customer segment. What you can do is you can let it go. You can let another company have it, paying, uh, buying a patent, licensing. Um, you can have the, your employees move and create a spin-off company where you still have some uh, profit from and so on so that you don't lose that technology. And that works also the other way around. If you have 
uh, if you see that there is a customer uh, segment that you could address and a value proposition that you could actually work with, um, but you don't want to invest the resources, then you can actually try to spin it off and try to have someone else work with it. Um, so you can use an open business model. So another example of uh, our AK, AAK works with the business model canvas was Tropical, which was the example of the chocolate uh, that doesn't look bad even if it has been in the, in the heat. Um, can I get someone from you to tell me how they work with Tropical in relation to the business model canvas? No one? Then, okay, if no one wants to talk, then you talk to the person next to you and then we, we move on. So one minute, just try to see if you can link the case of Tropical to the business model canvas and see how, how are they working with it. Yes? So, who wants, to, who wants to tell me now? Where is the mic? Yes, just give it to someone next to you. <laughs> I'm going to get everybody to talk, either this time or the next. So, yes? Well, we talked about that. The make a new value proposition for, for this example, they have some fat, which didn't work in the tropicals, and, uh, and the chocolate got white. So they make a new, well, kind of fat that could tolerate these changes of temperature, mm -hmm. well, in the transport. So that would be a new value proposition from yes. their side. Yes, we had, I saw another hand. Okay, oh. that's good because that was also my interpretation. So they started from the value proposition, they started from the on stage, and then they brought it back to their uh, off stage and they try to focus their key activities and the key resources to be able to provide a product that would solve their customer's problem. Um, if we, and, and what they also did is they did a lot of co-development with their uh, customers. And that's something that they do on a regular basis, not just with the Tropical case. So in the key partners part of the business model canvas, they actually have their customers because the customers are not someone are not just someone who's buying the product, but it's someone who's working on developing the technology so that they can have the maximum results. Um, and if we move from the business model canvas as something static to a business model design process, so how it works, when you see it in the book, it is described as a five uh, phases process, you have mobilize, understand, inquiry, execution, and evolution. And Implement uh, last week told us about the way they redesign business models for the customers they work with. Uh, and they actually use a free, uh, free phases project, process that uh, they call build, measure, and learn. And it's a loop, so every time you have, uh, you have learned, then you start building again. And it's actually very sim similar to what you have in, your, in the book. Um, they're just compressing the phases um, with each other. And what Implement also told us is a good idea um, to use the business model canvas in practice is actually to work parallel and not serial. Meaning that you don't start by looking into the value proposition and you do all the work and then you move on to the customers and you do all the work and so on. And then, you know, you fill the spots, you end up, you work on each part 
um, sequentially. So you finish one before you move on to the next. What the implement told us is, it's a good idea to have the business model canvas in front of you and work with the different pieces at the same time because the different pieces are connected to each other. So if you don't consider all of them at the same time and the impact that they can have on each other, then it could be very difficult for you to actually have a successful business model. Um, and the web van that I uh, mentioned before is actually a good example of that because they only focus on one part um, of the business model canvas. So moving on into the how. So now we have seen how do you work with what is outside your organization and connected to the inside through the business model canvas. How do you make your organization work? Um, we have seen uh, that the, the companies that talked to us, the, the guests we had, they actually mentioned different points of the SAR model uh, and actually they connected them all the time. Um, making the point that you can't have one without the other and all of them needs to be aligned. Uh, an example of this is uh, again uh, AAK uh, saying that they're not the cheapest on the market, they need to have customers that are willing to pay and uh, in return for that they offer flexibility and quality and they do co-development um, with their customer and that is their strategy and to ensure that this works uh, they need to have the right structure and the right processes in place and they do that by doing by having a quite flat structure where people within the organization are free um, to propose idea and propose solutions also when they're working together with the customers and they have processes that support the interaction with the customer and the co-development with the process with the customers and without those it wouldn't actually be possible um, if you look into the, if we look into the structure, our guest from Novo Nordis was quite clear in making us understand that the organizational structure is just something you put on paper, but when you're working with people, you need to be really careful because it's not just uh, a manager being a boss of someone, uh, but you also have a lot of other personal relationship uh, and also work relationship with the people in your organization. So what he said was, when you work with organizational structure, um, it's something different than when you work with organizational design and organizational development. When you're doing organizational development, you have an ongoing process, something that is con continuously on the move uh, and for which you need to adjust all the time. And what he also said was, be careful when you look at the structure first thing when you want to redesign an organization, because very often a restructuring is the last thing that you need to do First, you need to look at other things, and specifically he mentioned leadership development, he mentioned management team, he mentioned strategy revision. So, all things that you need to look at before you go and say, okay, we don't want to have a divisional organization anymore, we go and have functions. Um, and what he also said was, when you have an organization with problems, a way to understand where the problems come from is to look at their leadership. So look at the management and see what are um, the, uh, the strengths and the weaknesses of the manager. Very often you will find a connection. So again, he stressed how important people are in this process. What he also said is that they had very structured processes in Novo Nordisk and very formal. And that's very good also when you look into the rewards because, for example, when you start as a new employee at Novo Nordisk, you arrive, you have your computer, everything is nice, you can just start working and everybody's happy and you have no problem whatsoever uh, with, their, with, um, with the logistics uh, and with the technical stuff because they have processes in place to make sure that that works. But what he also says is the people that come work for us, they need to have intrinsic motivation. They need to have an understanding that they're working with a big company and they need to have the intrinsic motivation to fight against diabetes because that's what our organization is all about. So not only mentioned processes, but he mentioned the rewards part. So he said it's not only about pay, but it's about the intrinsic motivation of our employees. Um, and we had different, uh, if we talk about rewards, we had different example for the different uh, reward theory that you have in the book. Um, the, the welcome package that I just mentioned is, for example, uh, linked to the need theories. So you're, what they're giving them with the welcome package is actually a motivational factor, is something that like you are not expect 
you're not expecting when you start a new job that everything will be so nice and ready, and so that gives you motivation to contribute to the company. What I can tell you is, if that is established, so if you, um, if you have been working for a lot of years, uh, and every time you start in a new company, you get a new computer, everything works, everything is perfect, uh, and suddenly you get a new job and you go into an organization and there is uh, no computer for you and you have to order it and it takes five year, weeks to get it. We're not talking about a motivational factor anymore, but we're talking about an hygienic factor because now the condition changed. Your expectation was, I'm going to get a new computer. So it's not a motivational um, reward, but it's hygienic because if you don't get it, you get demotivated, you get unhappy with the company. Can you see the distinction? So, again, it's not just about, here we're seeing the inside of the organization and what happens within the boundaries of the organization. But it's not just this. What we, what we talked about this morning is that when you work on your case, you need to remember to look inside and outside. And it's the same here. When we're talking about rewards, you need to see the expectation and what's happening within and outside the boundaries of the organization for the employee that you're referring to. Um, another example we saw, uh, for example, for the expect expectancy theory, uh, Implement told us about the fact that they have evaluation and development uh, processes uh, to make sure that the employees actually keep on growing and they learn all the time and they feel, um, they feel happy and they feel appreciated within the company and they feel supported if they want to grow and do something new. Um, and in that sense, we're talking both about the expectancy theory and the goal setting theory because you know you have your evaluation process so you once a year or once a semester you're being you're sitting down with your boss uh, and he's telling you okay what did you do this semester and if you reach your goals you get a bonus or you get appreciated you get said oh you did a great job this year you know what you're not going to sit in the lab by yourself with your technical skill anymore i'm going to give you a team you're going to be a project team um, so we have the expectancy theory because the employees know if I perform well, I get something in return or I get recognized for what I do and I get something in return. And we have the goal setting theory because once a semester you sit down with your manager and you get all your goals lined up and you know, okay, this is what I want to do or what I have to do the next year. And in, it is, of course, goals that are reachable but are also difficult enough to be challenging for you as an employee. Um, we also saw equity examples of the equity theory because Novo Nordisk told us that they have diversity and internal flow indicators to check, okay, do we have, what is the percentage of women and men? Uh, what is the percentage of people that move around the company? Uh, do people perceive that they're actually being treated fairly within the organization? Um, so this was the reward part. And now I need to look at my, my points again. So do you, could, could you see a link between the examples we had in the talk shows and, for example, the reward part of the STAR model? Do we need to do the 2-2 again? Okay, so now turn to your left or to your right and talk to the next person. Try to see if you can find any other example that is connected to the rewards part of the STAR model. Then I only have one more point and then I promise to let you go.
Okay, who has the cube? Yes, can you pass it on to someone? Voluntarily or not? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, I think that actually they haven't talked specifically about the reward system, okay. but from what I have suspected by the employee that we're talking here, I mean, they were doing a good job, so they were like promoted to project manager or in a medium. Well, which company or which uh, guest? For example, the last one of Implement. Yeah. I mean, they were working alone in a development uh, department, so mm -hmm. they were like leading their, their team or their, uh, so. I think that there is a reward that they recognize you if you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. But we haven't asked specifically what were the system of yeah. rewards, so I don't know what to add there. Yeah, yeah. Someone else? Uh, the guy from Boston Consulting Group, he talked about uh, how much uh, responsibility he got when he first started. So he got a very challenging job mm -hmm. which were out of his uh, comfort zone. And that's also a reward to get something that's challenging and uh, helps you develop. So he was empowered. Yes, thank you. Empowerment is also one of the things you have in your, in your curriculum. So thank you very much. Um, yes, they haven't, it's true they haven't mentioned rewards specifically, but we have had a different cases. And one thing Implement also mentioned is there is a very good uh, video um, about what motivates people. And we don't have time to show it now, but it's on the Prezi. And, it's very easy to find. You Google how to motivate knowledge workers. And I encourage you to watch the video because you really, it really gives you an idea on why it is important to have um, a focus on intrinsic motivation and not only on the, uh, on the, on the, on the tangible uh, things like pay. And also, with, refer, with referring to that, uh, one thing that um, Implement talked a lot about was this link between exploration and exploitation. So how to keep your existing product line and also innovate, do something new. Uh, and, and what they said is uh, one of the issues is how to motivate people uh, to actually innovate. And how they do it, or how they suggest to do it, is to actually work on different points on this star. Um, and of course, one thing is you need to hire people that are creative, you need to hire people that have a strive to change uh, things and to create something new and to innovate, but you also need to support them. So you need to have processes that make sure that these people um, have the possibility to express their creativity and you need to have uh, the right structure. What they said is company like Maersk, it's a very good company, works great, but they have a very hierarchical structure. It's very difficult for people who are at the bottom of the organization to come up with good ideas and see their ideas implemented. Because it's very difficult to go to the CEO and say, look, I had a new idea for a new product, or I have a new idea for a new technology, can we work it out? Instead, in companies like AAK, where they have a flat structure, it's much easier, and you can have um, also formal and informal processes to support this. So I think I went through most of my notes. Um, do you have any questions? No? Okay. I hope this was useful. Um, thank you very much. And this afternoon you have the fourth case, and then we'll see you next week with the multiple choice uh, and so on. Thanks.